Good afternoon. Away we go. Revelation is continued today in chapter 14, starting in verses 14, the 14, 14. And then we'll do all of chapter 15 today. Uh, it'll be quite the deal. We're going to focus on the harvest of the earth uh, at first, and then we're going to have uh, oh so many things to talk about related to chapter 14. There's actually two different visions here at the end of chapter 14 that we'll be discussing. Uh, the first part being 14 through 16, and then next the verses 17 through 20. So a lot of different stuff uh, related to uh, divine judgment and what happens to those who are righteous and those who are not. God's uh, what, what, how God will handle those issues, deal with those people. People who are righteous and those who are not. Uh, verses 14 through 16, as we'll see, will uh, show the divine judgment, uh, which is shown if you're familiar with uh, the grain harvest. We, we see that throughout Scripture where there's harvesting and that's related to divine judgment. And then in, in verses 17 through 20, what you'll note is that there's a, um, it's kind of more of a much more violent vision, at least some people would regard it as, uh, regarding the treading of a wine press, which uh, depending on who you ask, depends on who is being treaded and what it comes out to. So we're, we're going to cover a couple uh, different viewpoints of what both of these harvests look like. Uh, there are a lot of different views, as you can imagine, just because with anything with a lot of symbolism, which is what we have here in Revelation, and especially with uh, this section of Scripture of Revelation, uh, symbolism can be... Um, interpreted many different ways and uh, and still gets you to where you need to go uh, without taking away from the main point. So there's some, some of these ideas here that we would need to hold loosely because there are theologians from many different spectrums, even from the same uh, denominations uh, and backgrounds and even seminaries who will come to different conclusions of exactly what is being said here. And, and most of them what we'll say is that you can't exactly say what John is saying because there's just so much symbolism uh, to be a part of this. So always keep that in mind uh, as as we go through Revelation, especially uh, this part of, of Revelation where we have so much so much more symbolism, it seems, than we have had, even though there has been a lot. I mean, Revelation is full of it. That's what you do in apocalyptic literature. You write with symbols to tell a story of what is being revealed or uncovered and provided additional information about not only the time in which you exist, this is what John existing with the Roman Empire and the oppression of the Roman Empire at this time, but also pointing forward as well, which John does. So what we'll do here is I'm just going to go ahead and read uh, the rest of chapter 14. So that's verses 14 through 20. And then we'll run through this, uh, this little ditty and... Uh, and then move into 15, and 15 is only eight verses long, so it's a relatively uh, short amount of verses today compared to how what we typically do, uh, but it's it's going to be, I think, pretty pretty good when it's all said and done. So let me, let me read uh, the rest of chapter 14, starting at verse 14. Then I looked to behold a white cloud, and seen on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle on his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, this is the second vision here, which is in heaven, and he also held a sharp sickle, had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has the power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth, and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. <clears throat> This is uh, just very interesting of what this is. I mean, the idea here is, uh, I guess you could also look at that as 1,600 stadia, 200 miles. I mean, it's, it's, again, one of those things that John does and what you do in apocalyptic literature is you provide these extreme numbers, numbers that are uh, unfathomable. I've used that word a lot lately. And the, uh, the reason they do that is to make a point about how extreme it is. Is it literally going to be <coughs> 200 yards or, or 1,600 stadia? 
I mean, it's just literally even going to happen. I mean, that's it's, again, look at it. It's 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 a sickle and it's harvesting and it's referring to grapes. So you have to think, okay, let's let's make sure we're not taking this literally here, but understanding the significance of what will happen to uh, people who are not um, followers of Christ at this time, and even to those who are followers of Christ. And we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. <clears throat> Uh, it is believed, and it's, this is, again, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that's up for debate, uh, that the one coming within the clouds uh, is the Christ, as noted back in chapter 1, verse 13. If you go back here in Revelation, uh, similar to what we see in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 13 through 14, where the one within the clouds to receive universal and everlasting dominion is provided to the one who is there within the clouds. Uh, the reference to the golden wreath uh, that you see here, or the golden crown, uh, it depends on, again, your translation, but it is more of that, that victor's crown uh, that we're seeing here and not the uh, the ruling crown, which some of the, the, the beasts earlier on had that sort of crown. I believe that's the, in Greek, it would have been the diadem. Uh, this is a different sort of crown uh, that is provided. And it's, it's one of those that it is someone who is victorious or who conquered. And they would give those two athletes in sporting events this sort of wreath of someone who had uh, won an event and, and, and uh, you know, of course, was, was the victor. Uh, so, of course, the wreath here des designates the Christ as the Messiah who conquered, uh, the conquering Messiah, the one who conquered evil, and thereby has a, uh, the right now to, to judge. Uh, like I said, this is, this is not the crown that was worn by the beast. Now, there is a crown that's mentioned at some points in Revelation that is the more diadem level crown. But this crown is also the crown that is, you, is worn by the elders that we see earlier on and will, again, see in, in Revelation. Uh, the sharp sickle here that we see symbolizes the instrument of harvest where the Son of Man or the Christ is prepared to reap the harvest of righteous retribution. You'll see here that I'll refer to the Son of the Man, Son of the Son of Man, or like a Son of Man, or like the Son of Man, depending again on how you're interpreting the Greek. Uh, as as Christ, uh, like I said, there are others who who won it. They're thinking possibly this could be an angel. We'll get a little bit more into that detail here in a second. But at this point, that's what we're going to look at it as as this is being the Christ. Uh, just a little bit more on the uh, the Son of Man because we're on that topic anyways. Is which we we do believe the Christ, but we also must look at this as how it's written here. Uh, we we must catch that as is like the Son of Man. The capitalization here is in uh, English. So if you see that here in, uh, well, it depends on your translation too. So this translation has it not capitalized. Uh, I've got some others here <coughs> that it looks like is not, and, but I knew that there are some translations that do capitalize. And the, the original text or the, the Greek that this was translated from does not have it capitalized, but there are some texts that will because they automatically think that it's the Christ. But like I said, there are debates about it. Uh, if you were to write the Greek out uh, specifically as it was written, which many times you don't do in translations because it'd be very awkward, uh, is what it'd be like something like one like a son of man, and so which is pulled from if you went back to Daniel again, chapter seven, uh, verse thirteen, and Daniel uh, means to be more of in a human form or look like a human or yeah, to look like a human, uh, a description that could be applied and has been applied to to angels, and so. We know that Daniel, there are many angels. We know in Revelation, there are many angels, and we're about to meet a few more. But then again, if you recall back in chapter 1, verse 13, that it is a Christ and not an angel uh, who is described as one like a son of man. So the same uh, verbiage that's used back in chapter 1 is being used here, so we could assume that it is the Christ. But then again, in the next following verse, here in verse 15, we have uh, the use of another angel. So someone would say that this is implying that the figure he was like a son of man, or like the son of man, again, depending on your translation, is understood to be an angel. But then again, that is not necessarily contrasted as another angel. It's not necessarily saying that it is. That's what I'm saying why it's confusing, because John doesn't provide any additional clarification. And if we were to look at it from the original text, based on just a plain reading of the Greek, it would almost feel like it's not. But then if you throw some context together from chapter 1, you could think it would be. So it, it may be this reference here of another angel from verse 15 could be a reference back to the angels earlier on in chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. So that could be very much the possibility of what that is. 
Uh, some have looked at the uh, the Reaper or this person here as the an A as, as a as an angel and not the Christ, as it would be strange, because what we're about to see here in verse 15, uh, it would be strange for an angel to tell the Christ what to do. Uh, as we see in verse 15, but then there's some back and forth on that as well. Also, the angel would most likely not know that the end has arrived. Possibly the belief is that the Son of Man would, but maybe the angel, again, I'm kind of expanding a little bit into verse 15 without actually being in verse 15 quite yet. Uh, but however, it seems uh, that the angel is no more than a messenger from God, whose purpose is to, uh, the angel's purpose is to reveal that the time has come to an end, uh, but is there to de deliver a divine command. Uh, mainly what this is trying to tell us here is that God is the one in authority and God is the one provide the authoritative command of what is to be done. <clears throat> uh, while we're close to 15, we might as well just jump into it. Uh, so the angel arrives uh, from the most holy place of the presence of God, as we learned back in chapter 7, uh, verse 15. To have judgment is a necessary function of righteousness. If God is truly righteous and just, then there is judgment that he is allowed to give uh, based on his own righteousness. And just not ours, not ours. We're not to judge, but he is to do that, and that is fine. <clears throat> As we see in verse 15, what we see with other angels, they cry out in loud voices to very much make a point, uh, to tell the one of the cloud uh, that the hour has come, uh, but also to let the rest of the world know uh, that the hour has come. So the angel yells, the angels above the earth yelling or exclaiming in a loud voice. Uh, the language, again, that we see here follows very closely to what the prophet Joel taught. So uh, we, we, of course, get a lot from the prophet Daniel or from the book of Daniel. Uh, we're also going to get a lot here from the prophet Joel, especially if you go to Joel chapter 3, verse 13, uh, where it talks about swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Uh, there's other, of course, um, references uh, to that as well. Uh, there's some debate here about who is being harvested. Uh, some see verses 14 through 16 as a harvesting of the righteous at the return of Christ, and then would say that verses 17 through 20 would be the harvesting of the wicked uh, at their judgment. But if you look at Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 37, it seems that the harvesting is normally used for gathering of the people for the kingdom of God. So possibly it is, uh, in, in both cases, it is the kingdom, the people, that God's kingdom people who are being harvested. However, the, the eschatological gathering or harvest is not limited to just the elect. So even in Matthew 9, we see harvesting is used for gathering uh, the people of the kingdom of God. We see in Matthew 13 uh, with the parable of the wheat and the tares that the harvest involved gathering both the wicked uh, as well as the righteous and the wicked, of course, for, for burning. So at least that's how that re is referenced in that parable in, in Matthew 13. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 51, the harvest was a sign of divine judgment. Uh, so we do know that. So we could conclude that we are seeing, uh, what we're seeing here is a general picture of the upcoming judgment. Uh, one thing we need to keep in mind is that there's not always a chronological order uh, that John is trying to keep here about how things are going to have an order. And I think we hit on that a little bit more, I think most likely in, in chapter 15. Uh, some have looked at this metaphor that we're seeing here uh, as the final metaphor, for the most part, for the final battle of God against the nation. Some, some take the two visions that we see in, in these two uh, sections uh, as uh, a bit further and easy. Uh, and it would be easy that we have the harvest of the elect and the second as the, the bloodshed of the martyrs. So, those, again, the martyrs, of course, would still be those who are righteous and those who are faithful. So combining the two, uh, it seems that John is saying that the harvest of the elect is won by the shedding of martyrs' blood, which is the, the wine that goes 200 miles, not the wine, but the blood, that is as deep as a horse's bridle and for a distance of 200 yards is that 200 miles. Significantly different is that of the martyrs. <clears throat> but if we were to stick with the theme of Joel uh, chapter 3, uh, we would see that both visions up to this point are punishment against the wicked. So it depends on how, high, how tightly you want to hold on to Joel 3, or if you want to just hold loosely to Joel 3 and look at this from John's uh, perspective. We know that he likes to grab stuff from Joel, Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, and other Old Testament prophets and likes to bring them into Revelation 
especially since those are other apocalyptic texts. He likes to bring those in, but sometimes he kind of mashes some stuff up. I don't think he does that as a way to deceive, but as a way to tell the story that he's trying to say. Uh, in verse 16, John is very brief here. We see that the Christ is seated, which is, of course, uh, we understand that to be a symbolic of judgment or judgeship or, or the authority to, to decide cases like, a, of course, a judge would. Uh, we, as those reading along, are left to our imagination as to what John sees. We do know that a sickle indeed is being swung. Now, this next section, the verses 17 through uh, 20, uh, we have the, the next referred to as the vintage of the earth. So now we're, we're dealing with grape vine references or grape references, which of course in that time and period would make a whole lot of sense to people because it's a much more, uh, people were much more tied to uh, agrarian work uh, during that time. So we have this other angel. Uh, we, we now get uh, John's view of the violent carnage of what he sees the final judgment to be. Uh, we will know that structurally there are significant similarities between the, the two visions. Both involve an agent of God's wrath uh, bearing a sickle. In each vision, the command to carry out God's command is given by an angel. A difference is that Christ uses the sickle for the harvest, while here in the vintage vision, the folks are gathered up by an angel. Uh, we can look at this as the same judgment with a slightly different perspective which uh, I think a lot of people do. So this is, these are just two different stories uh, or two different visions that are telling the same story. Uh, the, so you could look at this as the harvest served a more general presentation of final judgment, <clears throat> while the vintage vision shows us how violent that time will be. So as you can imagine, that amount of blood in that period of time at that depth is, is pretty grotesque. Okay. Uh, and, and as we continue on here, there's there's no separation here like in the previous vision of the separation of wheat and tares. Instead, there we have nothing but unmitigated judgment, it seems. Uh, the angel who performs this act comes from God's temple, showing us that God made this angel an angel, an agent, an a this angel an agent for this event. Like the Son of Man, the angel has a sharp sickle. Apparently, this tool is used for both cutting grain and a for pruning and cutting clusters of grapes. Who would have thought? I, I never would have thought that because it seems like the harvest sickle for grain was always so much larger than the one for grapes. But then again, I didn't live back then. So the tools they had are probably a bit different than what we have now. Uh, we have another angel entering the vision of John in verse 18. This one is from the altar, as we know from chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, the altar is connected with the prayers of the righteous. So if you go back, you'd be able to see that. Uh, what we can surmise is that the prayers of the righteous play a definite role in bringing God's judgment upon the unrighteous, or also known as the, the wicked. It seems that this angel is the one in charge of fire. Uh, we know from the study of angelology uh, that in the intertestinal period, angels are assigned various elements of nature. And Enoch, uh, in his books, writes about that with the angels of, you have an angel of thunder, a sea, hail, snow, rain, again, fire. Uh, and they do that, I mean, it seems like angels are in charge of different elements, is how that would be looked at or assigned different elements of nature. Uh, however, John is, is most likely thinking of the angel from chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, the, the, if you remember right, that's the angel who was at the altar and he filled the censer of fire and cast it down on earth, which is, seems to be a type of judgment. And as we know from other New Testament references, such as in Luke chapter 9, uh, Fire is typically associated with judgment. So the angel who is in charge of fire uh, commands the angel with the sickle to gather the grapes because angel fire, judgment, angel plus fire equals judgment. And, and then, of course, so has the command to be able to tell the other angel to gather the grapes. Uh, and, and if you go back to Joel chapter 3, verse 14, is, this is both a model uh, for this vision as well as the previous one. So just as the, the grain is ready to harvest, the grapes are ripe as well, and it's now time for judgment. The, the usage here of the Greek is that the time is very critical. Uh, those of the agrarian context during that time would very much understand what this means, as in when it is time to harvest, it is time to harvest. It's, we can't delay any longer because if we delay, uh, the fruit will become too ripe, or the, the wheat will be destroyed, or something bad will happen. And, and if, you, if you are familiar with farming or even gardening, you know that once something is ripe, it is ripe, and it can go 
bad pretty quickly if it is not harvested. Uh, and, and they knew that. Or they know if you've watched Little House on the Prairie and, and Pa had his wheat fields and then the hail came or the locust came and they understand the, uh, the, the, the need for them to, to, to work quickly. That is a very... Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it, the, when the grain is ready and you know the thunderstorms are coming, you better get that weed out of the fields, uh, that sort of thing. So they, they're very much uh, familiar with that. Uh, verses 19, uh, they, then going into 20, uh, without any delay, because the angel knows what to do, because that's what you do when you harvest. You harvest immediately as it, as it is time. When it is time, you harvest. Uh, the angel swings its sickle on the earth and gathers the vintage. This is consistent with what we know from First Enoch uh, chapter 53, where we have angels of punishment and those who destroy the kings and the mighty of the earth. Uh, what we see here is God's agent to execute wrath upon the unrighteous. We will note, note here that it is not just the angel who does the grisly work of judgment, uh, but we'll see in chapter 19 that it is Christ will also join in. Uh, John seems to believe that the Christ will be uh, part of the execution of judgment, which is sometimes hard for us to put our heads around because of the, the Christ that we, we have created in our own heads about always being uh, you know, that super nice soft guy. But at the same time, it seems when it is time for judgment, this time for judgment and judgment will be executed upon those who are not faithful so the grapes are now thrown into a very large wine press uh, which we will refer to now as the, the wrath of god as we know wine presses would be where people would trample on grapes to release the juices uh, which would then run out of the bottom of the press and the tre pre the treading of grapes uh, was a familiar figure for the ex executive uh, or the execution of divine wrath upon the enemies of God. Uh, we see that Isaiah chapter 63, uh, where God the warrior returns from Edom with garments stained as those uh, they were as those who are who tread on grapes in a wine press. Uh, the vintage or the grapes of the earth here are those who have had obstinate refusal to embrace the righteousness of God, thus making them enemies of God. I know mentioned I mentioned earlier that some would believe uh, that the grapes are the martyrs and that's their blood, but I'm going to go with more of the unrighteous angle here. You can go with whatever angle you want, but at the end of, end of the day, we're we're looking at God's judgment upon those uh, upon those who are righteous and, and unrighteous. Final verse of uh, chapter four. The city uh, being represented here is most likely Jerusalem. There's a lot of history and uh, a lot of detail to this that we don't have time to get into today, but we'll get into a little of it. Uh, the judgments of the nations from Joel chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 14, takes place in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, which tradition links uh, with the Kidron Valley, lying between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. Uh, this is the same place where in Zechariah 14, chapter 1 through 4, Chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, uh, places the final battle of righteousness. Uh, the reference to the outside the city uh, must be an allusion to the one or the Christ who suffered uh, for the sins of the human race outside the city gate, as seen in John chapter 19, verse 20. At least that's what some people believe. Uh, those who refuse the first judgment must take, now take part in the second. Uh, much like the wine press uh, yields the juice of the grapes, the judgment of God uh, issues the blood of the unrighteous. It is a hyperbolic term uh, regarding the depth and breadth of the blood, like I said. The, the 1600 stadia, uh, some of it, it says 200 miles here, some people estimate 184 miles. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's a huge and significant number. And like I said, it's been interpreted many different ways. If you think about it, and if people are trying to really use some symbolism here and trying to figure out what John was thinking of, uh, geographically it is the length of Palestine from Tyre to El Arish. Uh, so that could be possibly what he was trying to say, all-encompassing. Uh, symbolically, symbolically, if, if it's uh, 1600 stadia, uh, it squares to the number four, the four corners of the earth, or the four winds of the earth, and then multiplies by the square of ten. So what this could tell us based on that is that the judgment of God extends to all people everywhere all people everywhere who have not turned to God so if you want to play with some numbers there and look around that way that's one way to look at it is that you have the the idea of 1600 squares number four blah 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 uh, we learned by this that the uh, judgment is certain and those who are righteous will be vindicated by the judgment that was brought upon them by their oppressors, and they're this time the oppressors, of course, being uh, the Roman nation uh, and the Roman government who is oppressing the people. So, wow, 
That was a hoot nanny. Let's um, now go into uh, chapter 15 because it's only eight verses and it'd be crazy for us not to. <laughs> In this chapter, we'll be introduced to uh, seven angels who will pour, pour out God's wrath uh, on the entire pagan world. Uh, you may recall uh, the seals and the trumpets from the earlier chapters. The, the bulls are the last of this sequence and what was predicted uh, and the seals and the trumpets are fully executed now by the bulls. Uh, it is not wise, in my opinion, uh, to uh, think that the seals, trumpets, and bulls are in, like I was talking about earlier, it's not in one historical sequence. This is not John trying to give us a chronological viewpoint. Uh, the three cover the period leading to the end, presenting uh, God's judgment under a different set of images. So we're, all, we're seeing God's judgment provided in a few different ways here. So that's, that's one way uh, to look at this. <clears throat> Uh, the purpose of these three sets of visions is to show the eschatological truth of, uh, rather than provide us with data to figure out a precise chronology of the consummation of human history. So let's, let's keep that in mind, too. Uh, as we enter this sequence, we'll hear uh, the Song of Moses praising God for redemption and his righteous work. Some say there's two songs of Moses in here. We'll look at that a little bit. But ultimately, we see the, uh, the praising of God uh, and his righteous works. Uh, you will note uh, that the I, the author here has reworked uh, several ideas from the Exodus uh, narrative. Uh, you will note things that tied uh, that are tied to the plagues, uh, to the son uh, the son of Moses, the crossing of the Red Sea, and the Ten of Witness. All that is kind of tied here in chapter 15 and pulls a like I said. So a lot of Old Testament references get pulled into this. So it's almost like we're in a, uh, an interlude. Chapter 15 is the uh, preparation of the bulls with some celebration of those in the heavens over God's glory and redemption, followed by chapter 16, which will describe the outcomes of the pouring of the seven bulls. Uh, the end of chapter 16, showing that human history has ran its course, and though those who are not believers have faced the ultimate wrath of God. So That's, that's what we'll see here, and we're not going to get into chapter 16 today, but that is what this is all pointing to. Uh, and as we, the, yeah, it's really not broken up into two sections. Chapter 15, probably what I'll do is when I read through this, will be all the entire chapter because it's only eight verses. Uh, it is believed that, um, that John brings us to this point uh, to prepare the readers, or, or those of us today who are reading along, uh, that God's ways are just. Uh, they are about to experience a horrible uh, portrayal of God's, uh, of an outpouring of God's wrath, and John is assuring them that God is still just and God is still good. The seven plagues that we're about to witness uh, ties very closely with Leviticus 26, where God warns the Israelites, if you continue to be hostile to me and will not obey me, I will continue to plague you. Uh, some may think that these seven plagues are not the last ones as told by John based on chapter 17 and 18, uh, when Babylon is being destroyed. Uh, uh, it seems like what we see in chapter 17 and 18 is not a new plague or new plagues, but an elaboration of the seventh plague or the seventh bull. So that's how I like to look at that too, because John John has done that and will continue to, to do that. Like I said, this is not in chronological order, nor was it intended to be. Um, all right. <clears throat> Chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast, and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, or near the, of, near the sea of glass, again, depending on your translation, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous <clears throat> are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty, the righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures, hey, look, they're back, uh, gave the seven angels seven golden bulls full of the wrath of God, 
who's lives who lives forever and ever. It's, it's great kind of little worship scene. And a temple was filled uh, with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. All right, verse one. Uh, so we are now transferred from the great signs of the <coughs> of the woman and the dragon in chapter twelve uh, to a new set of signs. So if you go back and read about chapter what the the, the woman and the signs uh, and the dragon, you'll see what I'm referring to. But anyways, it's like we're 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 into another vision or another sign. And remember, signs are used to point uh, beyond themselves and to disclose the theological meaning. Of history, and that's what's happening here. Uh, the use of the number seven with angels and plagues, of course, provides those who know the meaning of the number seven that there is certainty and completeness uh, with the divine wrath against all unrighteousness. Uh, the signs that are we see here to be awe inspiring on all nature, humanity, and the kingdom of the Antichrist. And I think that's a, a key part that we sometimes miss is that the nature around us, the, uh, the creation in which God created uh, for him and for us, is to be awe-inspiring, and that's one part of why I think John writes the way he does in, in this regard. Uh, it's not something to be destroyed and, and burned up because we're all going to heaven, because if you read the rest of this, you'll see that there is a new heaven and a new earth, or a renewed heaven and a renewed earth, uh, and hey, it's the same earth. Sorry. Uh, the signs are be, uh, these, these final plagues are the last of the plagues. They complete the warnings of God uh, to an a world that will not repent, uh, that all remains in final, that all remains actually is final judgment at this point. The plagues re represent the final outpouring of divine retribution and are met with blasphemy by people whose hearts like Pharaoh. So if we go back to Pharaoh, again, a, uh, a mosaic Exodus type reference, uh, are hardened against God, as you remember with the plagues against Pharaoh. Uh, the more he, the more you had the plagues, the more his heart hardened. It is intentional that John uses the Exodus illustrations to make his point of hardened hearts. Plagues, and of course, redemption of the faithful, which at that time was the people of Israel. As we go into verse 2 here, this is the beginning of an interlude of victory that stands in sharp contrast to the following narrative. And we have the exaltation <clears throat> of the heavenly gatherings is just as glorious as the visitation of the wrath to come is somber. Uh, we see the victors of the final battle uh, with the beast standing victorious on the crystal service uh, before the throne. Uh, some people say that they're standing uh, next to it. Uh, depends. The crystal service or, or sea of glass is mentioned a couple of times in the apocalypse. Uh, we saw it last in chapter verse 4 6. This time it is mixed with fire, which most likely telling us how fantastical the vision is this is not uh, about wrath and judgment uh, that will come after this song of Moses that we see here but at the same time some people would say hey wait this is about wrath and judgment that's why you see fire because fire is about judgment so again depends on your translation on that uh, there or your interpretation how you want to interpret that uh, there with their hearts of God they they join together in a song of praise celebrating God's holiness and God's righteousness. They stand there victorious over the beast. Uh, they did not abandon their faith or succumb to the threats of the Antichrist or at this time th uh, to the threats of the, the Roman emperor. Uh, these are the people who overcame and to where the seven letters hold out promise of eating of the tree of life, if we saw back in chapter 2, verse 7, protection from the second death in verse 11 of chapter 2, uh, hidden manna, verse 17 of chapter 2, authority over the nations, uh, chapter 2, verse 26, white garments, chapter 3, verse 5, the honor of becoming a pillar in the temple of God, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, and of course the privilege of sitting with Christ on his throne, chapter 3, verse 21. So all that is coming to reality for them. Uh, remember the victory over the beast is about the struggle against paying homage to the image of the beast or being marked by the beast. That's a key point we need to keep in mind. Uh, God's harps as in they exist in the realm of God. Uh, the pleasant heart that we learn of in Psalm 8, 12, uh, which would be an appropriate instrument for songs of praise. So it makes sense that all these people would have harps. It's kind of where do they stored them uh, when they weren't using them because that's, that's a lot of harps. Uh, uh, verses 3 through 4 
we have the Song of Moses beginning. Uh, it's a song of praise, about praising God for his great and wonderful acts, his righteous and redemptive acts. Uh, some have taken this as two songs, but we will look at it as just one in this case. Uh, the deliverance of Moses from Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 18, pointing to the greater deliverance wrought by the Lamb, of course, that we know that to be the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this is a very Jewish act. Uh, this song as it ties very closely to Exodus 15. Uh, this song was uh, sung on the evenings of, of Sabbath uh, for Jews in, their, in the Jewish tradition during the synagogue service in, in a way to show Israel's greatest deliverance. Uh, it, was, it was a song sung but, uh, by every uh, pious Jew, and so they would, they would sing this song thanking God for delivering them from, from Israel. Uh, so this song is, uh, forms a base for the song of praise and adoration. The victors are giving to God, and God's works are good and righteous, so he deserves all glory and honor, which we can continue to remember to this day, that God deserves all glory and honor. Uh, please remember that this song is uh, not about celebrating judgment on the enemies of God, but the righteousness of his great redemptive act. So it's not about we win, you lose, you guys are all going to a very bad place, Sad, bad things will happen. You're horrible, horrible people, and we judge you. No, it's it's not that at all. It's it's more about how God is redemptive, just like to those who are faithful and righteous. Just like uh, Moses was victorious over the Pharaoh, and the Christ was victor over the world in John chapter 16. Here, the faithful have become victors over the demands of the imperial cult. Remember, they were forced to. Uh, <coughs> uh, first of all, you have to remember that John is dealing with his own context. Uh, but he's also dealing with a Roman emperor or imperial cult uh, that is really forcing people uh, to worship the emperor. And if they don't, of course, they'd either be killed. And, of course, then would not also be able to uh, buy or sell things and would, you know, not be able to make a living, which is not good for anyone. Uh, some people believe that this song was uh, part of a early, uh, was a popular hymn in the liturgy of the early church. Uh, it, believe, it is believed that almost every phrase was some would say about 8% of it is taken from different parts of the Old Testament. Uh, just kind of a, a very brief overview of this hymn. It's actually broken into two parts. Uh, the first part extols God's deeds and ways leading one to wonder and praise. Uh, and then the usage of the Almighty God plays into the imperial cult's belief of the emperor believing that he is almighty. Almighty mean that he has the power to carry out whatever he determines to do, but God is the one who is almighty and is victorious over the imperial cult. Uh, some have taken this to mean that the king of the ages, but it could also have been the king of the nations, countering the beliefs of the Roman emperor. So if you were to look at that, uh, king of the nations, there at the end of verse 3, uh, some, some have looked at this as king of the ages, depending on which translation you have, but the idea of king of the nations would be very much counteracting what the emperors believed that they were the kings of the nations. Uh, the second part of this is emphasizing God's justice and faithfulness, uh, not specific to one event, as all of God's redemptive works are great and marvelous, as we know. Uh, the awe is not just about what they saw, but because of the righteousness of the ways of God. Uh, this remains with the Old Testament theme based on God's righteousness is most often seen in his saving acts on behalf of his people. In the second part here, we see a reference to Jeremiah uh, chapter 10, verse 7, while at the same time echoing the song of Moses. Uh, we will receive a rhetorical question here at the end of, Who will not fear you? Pointing to the praise uh, that will follow. <coughs> that is the beginning of, of verse 4 that you see that. Uh, uh, it was common belief in the Old Testament that the Lord was the one true God, which of course, to us makes a lot of sense. Uh, there is a confidence that during the Messianic age, the nations of the world will worship the God of Israel and bring glory to his name. That's from Romans chapter 15, verses 9 through 12. Uh, this is adopted, or, or better said, adapted by John as an expression of the complete sovereignty of God over the Antichrist and those who follow the Antichrist uh, during that time period, or probably even to this day follow pagan or antichrist like types. Not that there is one now. Maybe there is. I don't know. Uh, the knowledge that all will eventually come before God and praise for him for he is holy. It is John's hope that the final plagues will finally turn all people to God. So John still has a lot of hope here. He is hoping that all nations will come and worship uh, God, that all people will see 
that God is the righteous God and that they need God uh, and that all will be, uh, all nations will come to God because of his righteous acts. And that is, that is his hope. So he's, he's a man of hope. And I hope we are people of hope. Oh, sorry, when it comes to this. Uh, it would make sense to interpret verse 4 as a metaphor of victory rather than an actual scene to be enacted at a specific uh, time and place. The reason being, it seems uh, a literal interpretation uh, could infer a doctrine of universal salvation unless the worship offered is in a grudging recognition of his righteous acts. Uh, we would need to look at this as a time of similar delivery experience of the people of Israel after they successfully crossed uh, the Red Sea is a reference uh, to that. Uh, they have been rescued. The difference is that the people of Israel were rescued from physical harm, but the witnesses in the throne room were rescued from spiritual harm. But you have to remember that many of them were martyred, uh, so they were not rescued from physical harm, but only spiritual harm. Uh, but yet they are still the victors. Uh, the people have followed uh, Christ, uh, who, is, who is the perfecter of faith. He led them through death, which made, made victory for all of humankind possible. They have followed the Lamb, and now they join together and celebrate the God uh, who has delivered them. Quite a celebration, as you can imagine, uh, for all people. Uh, verses 5 and 6, the song of praise is now followed by a description of the angels who will pour out, pour out the final seven judgments. Uh, the seven angels of devastation emerge. It seems here uh, that the temple is more closely defined as the tabernacle of testimony, or I believe the tent of witnesses, uh, which is, of course, the reference to the time Israel spent in the wilderness. Also known as the, like I said, the tent of witness, uh, that was a portable piece of, a uh, portable place of worship. Yeah, place of worship is portable, uh, that the Israelites carried with them as they wandered the wilderness, eventually making it to Canaan, a place of sacrifice, communication with the revelation of God. So this context here allows us to see God is consistent. The plagues come from his presence and show his unalterable opposition to sin. Uh, as you can recall, the ancient tabernacle was a tent of the testimony because it contained two tables of testimony, uh, brought down by Moses off of Mount Sinai. So you have that reference here. The angel, angels here are described as having the seven plagues but are not handed the bulls until uh, verse 7. Their journey out of the temple shows us their divine nature or divine commission or that they are angels with authority of God. Uh, the robes of linen are shining and clean, showing us the noble state of the office that they hold in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, the golden girdles or sashes represent royal and priestly functions, which is what they're acting as, priests. Uh, and many times angels in Revelation are acting as, as priests. Uh, so to put this together, angels come from the presence of God, arrayed as priests, and are given censers or bulls. Uh, verse 7, Now the angels receive the golden bulls of divine wrath from one of the four creatures. We are not told which one. I guess it doesn't matter. All we know is that the creatures, the four creatures, are guardians of the throne and have appeared throughout the text and will continue to make appearances. We know, we know them to be intermediaries between God and the avenging angels, known to inaugurate God's judgment upon the earth. Uh, we see here that the angel receives their own bull. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 8, the bulls were full of incense, representing the prayers of the saints. Uh, some would say since the bulls are only mentioned twice in these two contexts, the author may be telling us that there is a relationship between prayer and divine uh, retribution. Uh, we do know that the goal does not denote service to God. As we know from the great harlot in chapter 17, will hold in her hand a golden cup filled with bad things. So gold is not necessarily representing or denoting service to God. Uh, a few more things about the bulls. Most likely represent cultic utensils objects used in sacrificial worship, which of course these uh, would be what the priest would use and carry when they did the sacrifices, not cultic as in a cult, but cultic as in part of a priestly duty. Uh, these types of bulls uh, are used to carry away ash from the altars after the sacrifices uh, were burned. Uh, we know here from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7-9, through 9, that the bulls here are filled with God's wrath. And this wrath is about to expand dramatically. It is the wrath of God that has no beginning or no end. He is a living God able to execute, execute punishment upon all adversaries. And we know that from what Paul wrote there in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, similar to the angels from chapter 8, verse 5, who fills the bowl with fire and casts through the earth, the, there's several passages in, in the Hebrew Bible who speak of the cup of God's wrath. And now we are witnessing 
it. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17 is one example. Uh, we know that uh, from God's enemies must drink from the bowls of God's wrath, symbolizing God's punishment on them. So all that symbolism that you read about in other parts of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament alike, uh, are all kind of pointing to this sort of idea and the symbolism of judgment and what the bowls symbolize. Verse 8, uh, the, the smoke. Uh, smoke fills the temples uh, and the angel receives their bulls. This is to symbolize the glory and power of God as we see back in 1 Kings chapter 8. As we know from the Old Testament, God would reveal his presence by cloud or smoke. We, of course, know that from the Exodus experience, uh, especially if you looked at Exodus chapter 19. Uh, God descended upon Mount Sinai and smoke rose as a like much like a, a great furnace uh, much like in the old testament the presence of god in all his glory actively carries judgment upon wickedness and we see that here <clears throat> uh, we will see that nobody will be able to enter the temple until the seven plagues are finished and similar to how moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting or witnesses because of the cloud of glory of god back in Exodus chapter 4, 40. Not sure why John brings this up here. Some would say to make a connection uh, with the plagues coming from God. No one else can control these events. So very possible that's what is happening. Uh, the time for intercession has passed. So that's where we are right now in the book of Revelation. It has passed, which, which may be another reason that nobody can access the temple. God is in his, in his unapproachable majesty and power has declared that the end has come. He no longer is knocking at the door and waiting, but enters in his final act of judgment and the divine wrath is about to begin. So of all the chances, all the chances have been given. And it is now time for the wrath to come because God, though very patient, those slow to anger, judgment must come, and that's where we are. And he has given uh, ample opportunity for those who do not believe or those who are not righteous, those who turned away from God, to come back to him, to repent, uh, to live redeemed lives, and they've chosen not to, and so now they must face the wrath. Which will lead us to next week, chapter 16, the bulls of wrath. That will be fun. Uh, there will be six bulls of wrath at first, and then, like we've done in the past, there will be a seventh bull of wrath. And I think mainly we'll just be in chapter 16 next week. It is 20, a little over 20 verses. And then the following week, of course, will be 17. That'll probably be its own, probably part of 18, depending. Um, yeah, so we'll just kind of play it by ear as we go forth. And I hope everyone has a good rest of their day.